Welcome to tonight's Chaos Chat, and once again, we bring somebody from overseas to come grace the beautiful channel here on Heretic Wargaming. So go ahead and say hi, Liam. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name's Liam, and I'm from Australia. He is from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you have to put that in there. I'm from Australia. Um, but so, we're, we're all right, too. You know, you, uh, you know, we're not that bad. No, that's 100%. No, uh, I love having people from anywhere come on here, you know? Hell, I wish one day I could find somebody from Japan or something. That'd be cool. But, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, a fantastic. And so uh, Liam is well known over in Australia for being a very competitive 40K player. And so I wanted to, to get him on because I know right now he's got the chaos bug. But that being said, uh, Liam, why don't you go ahead and give us a bit of background on yourself? You know, why? how did you start playing 40K and so on and so forth? Yeah, no worries. So, um, as I said before, um, I'm from Australia. I live in Queensland, uh, Bri Queensland, sorry, Brisbane. Um, I started playing competitive 40K uh, about five years ago. Um, kind of all started when I thought I was really good, and then I played a player at a tournament who absolutely put me in the bin, and turned out that I wasn't very good. Uh, and he was kind enough to actually, um, you know, get me involved in some bigger tournaments. Um, our version of the ATC, which is a sort of modeled off the American ATC, um, and it sort of all stemmed from there. So um, when I'm not hobbying, I'm a doctor. I'm training to be a psychiatrist. Uh, and to be honest, I probably spend more time writing 40K lists than doing my job, but don't read into that too much. Um, I'm not really sure what else to say in that regard. Um, I play pretty much every army under the sun. I have played at different points in time, and I've been very, very lucky to be involved in the Australian team championships on a number of different years, regrettably cancelled this year, and also I went to the ETC in 2019 um, for Team Australia, which was awesome. Uh, we were very, very happy to come the fourth that we did. Um, I've been involved in a podcast over the last year and a half to two years. We're the normal blokes. You can find us on uh, Spotify or iTunes and whenever you get your podcasts. We're mainly a podcast. Uh, we talk about a wide variety of stuff, but we sort of focus on uh, more improving the competitive 40K experience is the slogan. And I do that with a couple of other uh, locals, um, Denise, Luke, and Jordan, the other guys run that one. But yeah, no, I'm um, sorry for the shameless self-promotion there, but I had to plug that one. <laughs> no, it's okay. And, and uh, 100%, the, the biggest thing here is that um, it's pretty crazy that we get a lot of people on that you might have never heard of it, and then like you find out this guy has a podcast or is a frequent flyer on whatever xyz show and it's just really interesting and if anything you know it, it allows people to hear more from you if they think that you have great ideas i think one of the awesome things about 40k these days is well one the internet but you know podcasts and youtube channels and streams and twitch kind of means that it's become a very global game um, you know, I listen to plenty of content from um, the USA and Canada, but also England. Um, I listen to the WTC Squadcast as well, and a few other really awesome um, content producers from, from all over the shop. And it kind of um, allows you to keep your ear to the ground more than just playing in your local meta. And I think that's why the game has become so diverse and so global. So, yeah, thanks for that. But I think it's, um, it's so good that 40K is where it's at. No, uh, and the beautiful part about Ninth Edition, you know, uh, especially with the changes to the missions, we're all now playing the same missions. So no, no longer is it the the excuse. Well, I play AT ITC and I play uh, ETC or whatever. We're all playing the same stuff now. Yeah, every, everyone's playing those GT missions, for better or for worse, whatever you wanna, however you wanna interpret that one. But um, because we're all playing the same game, and also because the edition is so new, there's no third-party FAQs, if there even will be. There's no real third-party mission packs, from what I'm aware of. People are sort of just playing straight out of the rulebook, so to speak. And so we're all, we're all quite consistent. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and, you know, we're stealing ideas from you guys. You're stealing ideas from us. Everybody can steal everybody's ideas. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's and, copyright. <laughs> exactly. And so that's what this show's about, is stealing other people's ideas. So before we get into uh, the lists and stuff that you wanted to talk about and, and bring to the channel, I have to ask you, who is your favorite Chaos God? Oh, uh, at the moment it's going to be Nurgle. And I say that because I am big Death Guard fan, have been for a long time. Um, but also because he's just so damn friendly. I love the grandfather. 
<laughs> no, it's true. He's the only one that literally gives gifts to his followers. Like that's his thing. <laughs> but uh, so that said, um, what kind of lists? Uh, so you're well known. Uh, I know you were on the Art of War Down Under talking about your Fabius bio list. Um, and so mm. that's that's one thing I wanted to talk about. But what is the thing that you're playing right now that that you're really into? So um, I'm at any given time. I, look, I am a shameless. I have a shameless lack of focus when it comes to this hobby. I am always working on at least like five different lists on Battlescry at any given time. It's kind of how I will pass my lunch breaks at work. So um, at the moment, I've got a couple of couple of different list ideas. Um, one I actually was lucky enough. There was a little RTT um, run by us, the, the normal blokes in Brisbane uh, last weekend, where I played um, Death Guard. So one of my lists at the moment is the Fabius Bar one that you mentioned. Um, which we can talk about in a sec. The one that I'm sort of playing most actively at the moment um, is my Death Guard, in inverted commas, Horde. So it's a list with um, 60 Plague Marines, 8 characters, and 2 Mephitic Blight Ballers, um, all with the Mortarians chosen for real 1s and 2s, 3, val- three Foul Blight Spawns, so 1 Blight Spawn per unit, so you essentially can't charge this army at all, uh, and everything's objective secured. Uh, it's all got bolt guns to use the cool strats to make bolt guns, AP4, uh, and obviously, you know, grenade character to make you throw mortal wound grenades. So it kind of just, like, walks up the table. Um, there's only a three-round RTT with um, 30 people, but I did end up winning that event, which was um, which was cool. Um, played some some good players and some newer players, so that was a reasonable test. Um, so I, I've always got a soft spot for Death Guard. I love the Plague Marines, and I just read one of the Horus Heresy novels, The, the Hidden Dagger, the last Death Guard novel before the, the, the War for Terror in inverted commas, and that was awesome. And it really wanted me to play Death Guard. It's kind of why I wrote a Death Guard list to start with. Um, I mean, any questions about that one? Or <laughs> Yeah, actually, I have a lot of questions about that one. Uh, so I think it's really cool because Mortarian's Chosen Sons, uh, to me, is probably my favorite. I know Poxmongers is like the obvious powerhouse. But uh, I think Chosen Sons is definitely, definitely up there. So obviously you don't have any transports, which I feel is super interesting. So um, can you can you kind of go down why you didn't take any transports? Why was it just a horde-focused foot list? Yeah, so um, all of my lists kind of have a very similar theme. And you'll kind of notice that in um, uh, if we have a chat about my Fabius Bar list. And also I'm sort of working together a Black Legion list at the moment. But that's I haven't put that on the table yet. So that's more of a you know, a mind game than anything else. All of my lists are foot slogging. Um, all of my lists, I do my best to make them mono faction. Um, and all of my lists, you shouldn't be able to pick any secondaries against that are reasonable. Um, for example, this Death Guard list has 60 Plague Marines and eight characters. Um, if you are, it, it, Picking Assassinate is kind of um, shooting yourself in the foot because it's, you know, eight characters that are all reasonably durable with their Feel No Pains and Toughness 5, but they're also all behind all of the characters and have reroll Feel No Pains of 1 and 2. So it's kind of hard for, you know, sniper units, even Vindicators, to pick them off, and also I can always heal them up with stratagems. So Assassinate's not a good choice, and there's no other ones you really want to take. I kind of feel like the core concept with building lists this edition, and Chaos did this extremely well because of the power of our infantry, same with Space Marines and Custodies is that you can build an army that essentially bleeds no secondaries. And then on the flip side, you can build an army that can just innately do some of the secondaries, making the game just overly easy for yourself. So in this list, for example, um, I had you know two HQs, the Chaos Lord and the Plaguecaster, the six Elite Choice characters. So it's um, three Far Blight Spawn, um, the Plague Surgeon, um, the dude, the noxious Blightbringer, the fellow that gives you two dice for advances, pick the highest, and he also has the relic to give all the Plague Marines a five-up invo. Uh, and then, um, what's the last one? The Putrefire. Damn. Thank you very much, the grenade fellow, the fellow who's got all the, the tree growing on his back, that fella. Um, then it's obviously the 60 Plague Marines with um, two flails in each and the rest bolt guns, Power Fist on the Sarge, and then two Mephitic Blightballers. So where the army kind of works is that You'll always pick while we stand, we fight. That's on the two Mephitic Blight Haulers and the Malignant Plaguecaster. The Blight Haulers very much just sit in the backfield to stop people from deep striking behind you. This also means that you don't have to protect your backfield. And if the Plague Marines are dying, you can actually um, 
pull all of the characters back to stand on the other side of the wall from the Mephitic Blight Hauler because it's a vehicle. Uh, it protects all of the characters, even if you've got units in front, which is very, very helpful. Um, so that's typically 10 to 15 points in most of the games I play. You're going to take raise banners, which this army is just inherently built to do. Every single model is infantry. Every single model can raise banners. Uh, and the final thing you're going to take is uh, largely dependent on your opponent. I often take engage on all fronts for, you know, eight to ten points, typically just by playing the mission, or domination, depending on the game that you're playing. So already you're sort of seeing that this list is a durable obsec army that achieves the majority of its secondaries just by playing the game. It's not really going to um, focus on killing my opponent. It's mainly just going to shift them off the key objectives, because what I absolutely hate is being distracted. Whenever I'm playing 40k, I never want to be distracted by units my opponent wants to throw away and are really, really annoying. So that, that's kind of what I focus on. I also think that um, focusing on a core of obsec models is kind of a must, especially with some of that new Necron stuff where the whole army gets obsec. That is absolutely crazy. If you're a Chaos player playing against that and largely all you've brought are you know, the, the elite units like Obliterators and Terminators and stuff, I, I think you're going to struggle quite a lot in the current meta because there's so many things that are obsec, with Custodes being prevalent, new Necrons being a thing, uh, there's lots of stuff that I think you just need that core of OPSEC for. No, that makes perfect sense. So uh, it sounds more like the way this army plays is it kind of balls up, takes the center of the field, and you just kind of sit there? Yeah, so pretty much. So if, you, if you're looking at like me playing, let's say, a, a Dawn of War game sort of as, a, as an example, I'll kind of deploy slightly off-center. So let's say I just deploy slightly to the left-hand side of the table. I'll then move up and sort of force my opponent to go into hammer and anvil mode. When you're in hammer and anvil, you can control all the objectives to the left because they've sort of moved away from you. If they don't move away from you, you throw 20 black grenades at them and everything in 40k dies. Nothing really survives that, which is awesome. Um, because you can do that grenade strap with the plus six range, now you've got a 17 inch threat. So it's not, it's not huge, but it's also not small enough that they can be like 10 inches away from you and safe. So you sort of bully them away, make the game hammer and anvil. And the reason why you want to make the game hammer and anvil is then they can never slip around you. Those crafty Harlequin players and whatnot can't get around you if you're playing hammer and anvil and you're in the middle of the table because all you need to do is move five inches, spend two CP to restore a model at the front of your unit, getting you three inches extra movement. So now your Plague Marines actually move as fast as Harlequins, eight inches and then you charge and you move much faster than they expect you to, and you always catch them. You always get the Harlequins if they try and go around you. Also, most of the missions, the objectives are like not on the board edge, obviously. The, the reasonable percentage of them are towards the center of the table. So once you've bullied them sort of away from that point, the onus is on them. You don't have to do anything. I just have to live and stand there to deny you primary, get my primary, and do all of my secondaries. So then the onus is on you. You've got to come to this army and because there's three Foul Blight spawn, one of which has the Fugaris Helm, the Death Guard Relic for plus three range, you've got an aura of 10 inches and two auras of seven inches of, if you charge me, I'm going to hit you first. And to be honest, Plague Marines are not going to compete with like top tier melee units in 40k. But those flails are not a meme. They are going to kill a few things, especially units that want to come steal objectives like Harlequin Troops or even uh, Alaris Custodians. A buffed up unit of Plague Marines with um, Blades of putrefic Putrefication, the Psychic car, they will kill quite a, quite a fair few Imperium units, to be fair. No, that's actually a brilliant idea, too, uh, because I think the two chapters of Space Marines we're going to see probably the most of, uh, at least in my initial assessment, is going to be pretty much Salamanders, <laughs> and then uh, White Scars. Dark White Angels. Scars. Oh, really? Oh, I, yeah? I thought we are going to see a lot of Dark Angels, man. I can agree with that one, too. Um... How do you think this this would actually match up into Dark Angels? That would be actually a really interesting matchup. Well, there's a couple of things that are really interesting here. Um, the Dark Angels sort of things that I'm seeing quite a lot are the obviously the the plasma inceptors, which are incredibly strong, and you can you can um uh, I'm not sure if that's strap ported over to the new codex, but I, I know you could previously buff them to damage three when you overcharge them with the strap but also the, the Deathwing Knight combos with all the ridiculous buffs you can get on them, including making them essentially have permanent transhuman physiology, the only wound on a four-up. The reason why I think the Death Guard um, adjusts to that extremely well is a couple of things. 
first of all, the, the ability of Death Guard to put out mortal wounds at close range is prodigious. Um, secondly, the re-rolls, especially in combat for um, Death Guard melee weapons, namely re-roll hits of one in my list, or you could do full re-rolls if you have a tally man, and then re-roll all wound rolls with the Arch Contaminator Warlord trait, actually works out very well against things that can only be wounded on a four or better, because it's not a modifier. So you can, even though like other armies, for example, lose half their wounds, we halve that again because you re-roll all of your wound rolls that fail. This makes one, two, three fail. Unlike previously where, for example, um, if somebody like a Harlequin has a neg one to wound ability and you hit them, you previously couldn't re-roll the first of those threes because of the way modifiers and re-rolls work. But the way transhuman works, it just says one, two, and three becomes a fail. And this really ports quite well in the sense that if I'm hitting something that I'm only wounding on fours, I actually get to fish for mortal wounds more than I did before, not less. So ironically, um, Death Guard are quite very, are very, very well positioned to deal with um, tough marine bodies, especially those with transhuman physiology, and especially those that rely on very good armor saves and invos to live, aka Deathwing Knights. In addition, so much of the Death Guard cool stuff uh, is three damage flat, which I think is very, very ready for the current um, for a lot of marine builds. And yeah, custodies and other things too. I mean, my list has three foul blight spawn for that almost exact reason. Um, the AP3 three damage flamers are very helpful. But other lists, um, Poxmonger lists, for example, um, spamming multi melters from the haulers, or even the three damage minimum entropy cannons from um, uh, plague burst crawlers, these are all profiles that are very, very, very good at killing Grey Knights, Marines, custodies. And things like that. So the, the reality is, is that I think Death Guard players are actually really positioned for these changes in the meta. The other thing as well is that it's it's very clear that you know merely units are with each you know let's call them a mini edition because you sort of have codexes come out in a, in a chunk like like we're seeing now. We have you know Marines, Death Watch, Blood Angels, Dark Angels, or whatever. When you see this chunk of books, it kind of makes its own mini meta for a couple of months. And I think at the moment, even though we're a bit behind only having one wound on Plague Marines, I reckon Death Guard are in a really bloody good spot to deal with that mini meta. No, I agree. And I would actually probably argue that they're probably the best thing we have right now. Uh, I will say, having put Chaos Space Marines on the table several times in ninth, they do not feel good right now. <laughs> no, no, they do not. It's super depressing when you are got your one wound Chaos Space Marine who shoots his AP nothing bulk gun at an intercessor with two wounds, five up, feel no pain, and AP three stalker damage bulk gun with two damage. You're like, why? Why is this happening? It's, <laughs> it feels bad. Yeah, and I, I don't know. Uh, I can't wait for two wound berserkers because, man, I'm going to be so happy. But, uh, That'd so, be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be so great. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, what other lists? I, I know you had mentioned Fabius Bile. I'm actually really interested in Black Legion because I think Abaddon is fantastic right now. For sure. Um, so, what do you want to talk about first? The, the Bile one or the Black Legion one? What's your preference? You, you lead the way, sir. Which one do you want to talk about first? <laughs> Well, look, I, I know the bar one well, so let, let's do the, the Black Legion one first, because that way if I sound like an idiot, I can finish off with something I actually know well. Okay, so, sounds good. <laughs> so with, with Black, um, I am considering playing Black Legion um, almost entirely for Abaddon and for the three, three CP strat world killers. So the thing is, is that GW always told us that the Psychic Awakening books um, were all written with ninth edition in mind. And you know what, there are some of those rules that I think are, are, you know, I think would put the lie to those words. Some of the rules are just not even written appropriately for this edition. But some of them I think are kind of sleeper stratagems, sleeper abilities that do port incredibly well over to ninth edition. One of them is that strap, the world killer strap. It's a three CP stratagem and it's written quite poorly but the conservative way to rule that is your opponent essentially table-wide cannot use objective secured. Now, the reason why that's um, absolutely ridiculous is you do the stratagem at the start of the battle round. So in this edition, it, it's undeniable from you know the Goonhammer stats and other people who've analyzed it that you want to go first. So think about this. 
you now have a stratagem that you do if your opponent's going first. You do it at the start of their turn before they score points. And what it allows you to do is turn off their obsec table-wide for 3 CP, which, to be honest, you can do for three or four turns and still have CP to spare if you've got Abaddon in the battalion. So the way I kind of envision a list like this working is you have some key damage units, be they... Um, Havoc, so kill shot, pred, trio, um, some melee units. You could put Demon Princes or Khan the Betrayer or whatever you want to put in it. But the rest of the list is 210 cultists or 180 cultists, something like that, with Abbott on the Despoiler, which was a list at the ETC last edition. I played one of Spain's players who had a similar concept, but I don't think it, um, I don't think it was in the right edition almost. I'm kind of inspired by that because I think it's better now. All you're going to be doing is you're going to be, you know, throwing cultists to people and warp timing them up, keeping them behind terrain and wrapping enemy models. Because yes, you can use two CP to get out of combat. It doesn't help you if you wrap two separate units. You can still do it. It's still a thing this edition. And if your opponent, for argument's sake, as happened to me many, many times, let's say I have one cultist on an objective. So all you know, I managed to just get there to my opponent's objective. Then in their turn, sorry, in uh, they might have, let's say I'm playing against custodians, they might have three custodian guard just standing on that objective. At the start of their turn, I spend three CP, and then suddenly I have one obsec model on the objective, you have zero, it's now my objective. You're spending CP to directly take points away from your opponent. And you've got no excuse if you've got 180 cultists. You can move in advance, warp time, move in advance them, 2 CP to bring them on from board edges, or just, you know, strategic reserve them for like one CP per 30. You can get these cultists all over the damn table, hiding in ruins, on objectives, and if your opponent tries to take it off you, you're fearless, and you spend 3 CP to take their obsec away. The better thing is, if you're going first, this gets even more annoying, because you spend 3 CP. If you think about it, the equivalent way this works is that your units for a whole battle round have super obsec. They will override anyone else's obsec or models. So then all you have to do all you really have to do is get one cultist onto an objective, even if they've got 10 intercessors around it. If you get one cultist onto that objective, you steal it. You take away their raised banners. You stop them doing whatever action they're doing, and they don't score primary in their turn. Especially for you know many armies that don't just have heroic intervention army-wide. Some of them do. But for those armies, you don't have to charge them. You can just tag the objective because they're big damn frisbee markers now, you know, the 40 mil objective marker and then three inches out from that. All you have to do is put one cultist on the objective and regardless of what faction they're playing, you will steal their objective marker. I think this list is even more potent now considering I think Necrons are going to be coming out of the woodwork because Necrons have that um, Legion trait, which is everything gets a six inch pregame move and everything's obsec. And things that are obsec count as two obsec models. Yay for Necron Warriors. But now you can use cultists to obviously, you know, Mark Slanesh, double shoot with Bets the Long War, kills quite a few things. And then you just have to put one model on an objective and they can have infinite numbers of obsec, double obsec, whatever. You take their rules away. You just don't care. The crazy thing about lists like this too is it, it builds itself to secondaries like I've already spoken about. You can take While We Stand and just make the While We Stand your three important characters. That's 15 points. You can do Raise Banners. Very easy to do with an infantry-heavy super obsec army. It's going to be hard for them to take your banners away as well. And even better, you could do Engage on All Fronts or Domination if you're going to be trying to do that anyway. Yes, this list does give up um, thin their ranks. Quite a few armies actually can kill 180 to 210 cultists. But by that point, you've 45 the primary, and you're going quite well anyway. Also, as people continue to take Eradicators with their silly multi-melters, still only kills one cultist at a time, which is excellent. So, you know, I think stuff like this ha has a place. I, I want to try it. Um, I might be completely insane, but something about me really wants to just put, you know, that many super obsessed cultists on the table and call them fearless. No, it's true. And then uh, on top of it, you know, you could do Marcus Zinch on some of them to have five up invulnerables. Like you said, you could have Feel No Pain on some. You could do Marker Corn on some close combat ones if you want to double fight stuff to get double moves. Like, there's a lot of little janky things you could do with cultists, and it's true. Um, I've ran 90 this edition. Uh, they all died. But, <laughs> but I think 210, you might actually be on to something. I, I, I will never, like, I hope that you're barring on those. 
I, yeah, look, uh, what my girlfriend doesn't see me spend can't make her mad. That is true. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Liam has 210 cultists. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so let's talk a little bit about your Fabius bio list, which, by the way, I do love that Black Legion list. Uh, I do agree. World Killers is definitely a strat that you could build around it, and I think people are definitely sleeping on it. Um, but let's talk about your Phoebus bio list a little bit. So this is one I, I know quite well. Um, I haven't taken it to an event, but I played during the sort of COVID lockdown here in Australia. Um, we were very, very lucky that we could still do um, very, very small gatherings of like um, three or four people for a period of time. So I was actually able to ironically play more 40k, not less, during that period of time, um, whilst you know obviously being conscious of um, the concerns of my friends and my family, um, and my workplace for that matter. But I played so so many games with this list. I, I think I played uh, 30 to 40 games over the span of, gee, like uh, three to four weeks. I, I played so so many games of 40k in that time, and almost all of them were with this Fabius bar list. Uh, my friend Denith, also from the podcast, uh, took that list to a Tabletop Simulator Tournament, uh, one of the pods, ooh, I think the Battle Tor Toys was the name of the people who ran that one. I, I don't 100% remember. But um, basically the list um, stems around the Chaos Space Marine um, Creations of Bile Legion, which never saw anyone run before. And I initially started looking at, you know, just to sort of... I was reading the rules more for fun. And when I got about three rules in, I was like, wait a minute, this is actually really strong. So I, I built the list from that. The list is very, very simple. It's um, the newest iteration of it is um, one patrol and one vanguard detachment. So the vanguard detachment is um, a master of possession and an exalted champion with a power fist. It's then got 60 possessed marines, all with mark of corn at the moment. So that's 120 wounds of marine bodies with a five of invoke. Uh, and then a unit of Havocs with the Reaper Chain Cannons and a unit of Havocs with Laz Cannons. You've then got another detachment, which is actually a Word Bearers Patrol. And this one's sort of um, really finicky. This is Fabius Bile with his little, you know, Surgeon Jimmy Acolyte, a Sorcerer with a Jump Pack, and um, just five Chaos Space Marines. The list has about um, 30 points spare. Now, what's interesting about this is that to play... Um, creations of Bile, you must have Fabius Bile be your Warlord. So Fabius Bile is the Warlord, makes that patrol free. What's cool though, is Fabius Bile doesn't break other Chaos Space Marine detachments. So the irony is, Fabius Bile is the Warlord and allows the second detachment, sorry, allows that first detachment to be Creations of Bile, but he doesn't stop that first detachment from being Word Bearers, which allows the Word Bearers dude to access the stratagems that mean you never fail psychic checks when they matter. Because who hasn't played a Chaos Space Marine game where you failed warp time at a key moment or death hex when you really needed it? Word Bearers is like absolutely mandatory if you're going to be relying on some of that stuff, in, in my opinion. The army is very, very simple. Um, it works kind of like an onion in many respects. You move that little character blob up. It's surrounded by layers of possessed that are um, within six inches of bile. You make a little gap with your first unit. You advance bile forwards. The second unit advances and forms around Fabius Bile, and then after he buffs them up, because Bile allows you to do plus one strength, plus one toughness, or plus one attack, you can then warp time them forwards. Why is it why is it creations of Bile? A couple of reasons. The Bile trait is plus one strength and plus one movement for everyone in that detachment. So those possessed are now base movement eight. Yay, we're an Eldar too. And also their strength six base. That's crazy, because it means for things like you know, Tyranid Gaunts, uh, the new Necron Scarabs, Guardsmen, everything in between, you're straight up wounding them on twos. Strength six also means that you're you know, wounding all the T5 models, in, like Custodies, for example. You're wounding them all on threes, which is so damn good. But it's Fabius Bar primarily for the stratagems. There is a one CP strap in that book for you can advance and charge, and you get plus one to your advance, and plus one to your charge. For one CP, advance and charge alone would be enough, but the plus one advance and charge is pretty pretty huge. So you're moving eight. Your minimum advance is a two, one plus one. So then if you warp time, which you cannot fail in this list, you're moving a minimum of 20 inches, a maximum of 30. So these possessed units are essentially running across the entire table in a turn. Very little can stop them. 
but also some of the other bile straps are just um, they're just unimaginably good. So there's a one CP strap in there called Monstrous Visitors, which is money. It's a- absolute cash money, in the sense that so what it is is you pick an infantry creations of bile unit. Whoop de doo, your whole army is that. You're then going to um, it creates an aura around that squad of six inches of neg one to hit for your opponent. Now, that sounds average at best, because you're thinking, hey, look, people might be shooting me from far away, so then that aura doesn't matter. But again, this army is 60 infantry models. You can hide most of them reasonably well, or reserve one, and you're moving 20 to 30 inches a turn. So by and large, especially on Dawn of War, you're in your opponent's deployment zone turn one, which means with a big 20-man possessed unit that has a huge footprint, you're hitting a lot of units with that six-inch aura. But it gets better. It's not neg one to hit against your unit specifically. It's a debuff on the enemy units. So it doesn't matter if those enemy units are shooting other possessed units. They're still neg one to hit. So for one CP, you can almost, almost give dozens of your opponent's units or half the table an aura of neg one to hit for one CP. But this strat gets even better. You can use this stratagem in any phase and it lasts until the end of the turn. So, start of the command phase, for argument's sake. You can use this stratagem. It then lasts for their movement, their shooting, their psychic, and their combat for that one unit. But because you can do it any phase, it doesn't just have to be one unit of possessed. I can do it on one unit of possessed in the command phase, one unit of possessed in the movement phase, and one unit of possessed in the shooting phase. And now, my entire 60 possessed blob, if you're anywhere near any part of my army, you're going to have neg one to hit. That just, that just stacks up so much. All Mark of Corn, so it can all fight twice. These dudes are pumping out a ridiculous number of attacks at AP2, which is very, very handy. And to sort of you know cement the overall thing, because Bile and his little surgeon buddy can add or subtract one from his role to see who they, um, what modification they get, you can always choose plus one toughness. The way to think about it is it's not 120 marine bodies. It's 120... Toughness five bodies with a five up invo, three up armor that could be neg one to hit and can master of possession to be a four up invo as well. 120 T5 four up invo bodies is not squishy at all. It's very, very, very resilient. And the per unit putting out, you know, uh, 40 to 80 attacks, hitting on twos with precincts or full rerolls, because to ramble on even further. One of the other creations of Bile Strat is just pick a unit at the start of a phase within 12 of Bile, they get Chapter Master rerolls. Crazy, because you can do that and then move out of range of Bile because you don't have to stay within 12. It's just pick a unit start of the phase. So these units can reroll all hits, reroll all wounds, fight twice, be strength six with 100 attacks if you add plus one attack to them, and it, it gets out of hand very, very quickly. The problem with this list, because uh, there are bad parts, obviously, the problem is uh, morale definitely hurts it. There's no way to make this army fearless or have any modifications to your morale checks. Luckily, this edition is more forgiving to big squads than our last edition. And also, it's not objective secured. So unlike the Death Guard, this is an aggressive army, not a defensive army. This army has to kill um, the majority of the opponent's list. It really has to sort of hammer them hard, because otherwise, um, obsec units will just um, wreck your day. The advantage of having 60, 32 mils, though, is that it's not too hard to fly across the table and physically make it impossible for them to touch the, some objectives. So you can move into those central L's that are very common in Nova-style terrain, LBO terrain, hold those objectives, not be shot, and physically stop them from getting there. Um, the Havocs are primarily there because I had points. That's probably the part of the list I would change. Um, I love having the Reaper chain cannons in the list because it sort of helps me um, use them first to clear away screens and things that would otherwise stop me. And also they're an awesome backfield unit to just pick up scions or things people are using to score points. The cool thing about the um, Havocs is that they move seven inches now because of Creations of Isle, gives plus one movement, and they don't take movement penalties. So these guys are actually moving kind of like Dark Reapers, um, floating around the table shooting things, which is pretty good. And no one really wants to shoot five Havocs when there's 20 Possessed running at you, you kind of have to check your priorities there. 
So that's that's that list. Um, it's very, very well tested. Um, it absolutely gets dumpstered by some custody lists because they can ignore AP1 and 2, but it is very, very effective against your the standard marine builds you're seeing at the moment. No, uh, 100%. I could definitely see that. It, it almost reminds me like you're playing uh, Swarm Lord with a bunch of gene sealers. Yeah, I, I think it does that. Um to the nth degree. Like, it, it, it's, it's doing that just so much better, I think. It's, the only problem is it's not obsec, which I think it, it, it does hurt it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can definitely see that. Like you said, you, you obviously have played into the matches where you're like, oh, well, this isn't very good. Uh, but, yeah, no, that's really interesting. That's definitely a change from, from what you had previously talked about. So I like that. I like that evolution. And I think um, one of the, the things about like, a, a list – like this and something that you know I kind of defeat the purpose by talking about it um, on on the show but um, lists like this um, from some of the less played factions um, catch even competitive players by surprise a little bit because they're not even if you know about the strategies you haven't played them enough to know every interaction and that, that that's for me too like I, I've read the new marine codex I've read the new necrons codex but then because I don't play those armies anymore, I don't know the combos as well as other people. So then, if you're even a, a competitive player playing against you know, Fabius Bile and his 60 possessed jimmies, and they use that stratagem for neg one to hit, but what they've done is they've formed like a line of possessed around you know half of your army, and you're playing guard or admech or something, and you realize now that, you know, that one CP gives Neg1 to hit to 1,500 points of your army, that's a huge impact on the game. That's, that, that's massive overall. And you might, not have, you might have thought that stratagem really only affects combat because of how small the aura is. But it's not one 6-inch aura. It's, 60, it's a 6-inch aura from 20 models. It can actually cover a lot of space. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> that's all good. Uh, happens. Uh, but no, a hundred percent. No, that is a fantastic use of that strat, and uh, I love that. I love the fact you're playing like Alpha Legion mixed with something crazy fast. I don't know. It's really cool. I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> no, all, all great, awesome things, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, these are great lists, and, and, and definitely, I love get, having guys from different metas, because you just have a completely different take. I mean, all three of your lists are completely infantry-based, and I can tell you, all the people I've had on, none of us have talked about this sort of stuff, So, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> I um, I think one of the, like, the biggest thing for me is just, uh, I've played those Poxmonger-style Death Guard lists, Um. I, I've played many variations of it, um, and they're, they're so strong and they're really hard to kill and they kill so many things. But then, you know, you, you go to an event, you play on a table when the train's a bit dense and you can't move through walls and you cry. Like, I just, I, I never want to be in a situation where a wall stops me from winning a 40k game. And that's why all of my lists are infantry or beast base because I, I, I just I need to be able to move through those walls. I just can't deal with it otherwise. No, uh yeah, I, I can agree with that. Uh I'm a big fan of demons right now. I think demons are so good. So good. But uh <laughs> got putting those on the back burner play some Death Guard myself, so you definitely inspire do me. It, do it. Yes, do it, do it, do it. So that being said, we've been going on. I, Liam's actually on lunch right now doing this, so you guys better thank him. Um, so you got any last-second shout-outs, <laughs> uh, uh, re-attacks, anything you want to say before we log off? No, um, keep soldiering on, everyone. Enjoy playing the hammers when you can. And um, James, thanks very much for having me on. That was awesome. No, thank you so much, Liam. And thank you guys so much for listening to yet another Chaos Chat. If you guys enjoyed this Chaos Chat, please like, subscribe, share, and I will see you guys on the next one here at Heretic Wargaming.